Okay, welcome to the uh, last seminar in the series for this year. Um, and it's a great pleasure to have Hal Arvarian today from Berkeley Economics, and Chief Economist at Google Labs, join us. Uh, we were just chatting that uh, my old co-author and longtime friend Skip Lupia holds a chair named for him at uh, the University of Michigan, uh, where he was before he came out to California. Uh, so please welcome Alvarian today to talk about the economics of internet search. So thank you very much. I had to check a few times to make sure I was really in Southern California. Uh, just a few days ago, actually, I went to a seminar at Google where one of the people that works with me presented a nice talk on the impact of the weather on Google. So if you look at Google queries in different locations, especially locations that have weather, uh, you see quite, a, quite an impact. And, and, and what turned out, the bottom line summary was, uh, it's good for Google if the weather's bad, but not too bad. So if it's bad, people stay inside at their computers and search like they're supposed to do. But if it's too bad, the power goes out and they can't do anything. So. OK, so today I want to talk to you not so much about the sociology or the behavioral aspects of internet search, but really about the economics of internet search. And uh, as everybody knows, everybody uses search engines. Now, these numbers are old numbers from the Pew Foundation, but it says 84% of internet users have uh, used search. And I would, gave, I, I would say, what do the other 16% do? It's uh, unclear. Lots of people use search engines on any given day. And of course, as you all know, they're highly profitable. So with the search engines, the business model is selling ads. So I'm going to talk about the economics of internet search. I want to talk a bit about how that ad business works. So the ads that you see in search engines are highly relevant. They're the gold standard as far as ads are concerned. Uh, but even so, advertising is still a small impact business in some ways. You look at search, about 2% of the ads might get clicks. Maybe 2% of those clicks might end up in a conversion. So you're talking about four out of 1,000 people that see the ads actually buy. And the amazing thing about it is that's good. That's good performance. If you think about an ad that you see on TV or an ad that you see in the newspaper or a billboard or almost any other medium, the impact of those uh, ads on actual purchases is a very, very tiny number on the order of one out of 1,000 or, or less. And so what that means is to really work, advertising has to have scale. Uh, and uh, that scale is pretty critical to the business. So to give you a little example from another medium, if you look at the history of radio, uh, people try to figure out a business model for broadcast radio. And of course, it had this problem of no exclusion. Anybody who wanted to could listen to the uh, broadcast signal. So uh, the challenge, they, they, they tried commercials. And the challenge with uh, radio commercials was that the signal could only cover a given geographic area, so you had to have a high enough population density that enough people would see the ad that would translate into sales that would pay for the generation of content that would encourage enough people to listen to go buy the ad and that really, I mean, to go buy the product. So that meant, really, that there were only a few cities in the United States that could actually support a commercial radio broadcast model, New York, Chicago, LA, a few other places. And then AT&T got into the act and said, wait, we can carry those radio signals from one radio station to another over copper, rebroadcast it so you don't have to create this, a new content in every city. You can just create one set of content that then can be broadcast around the country. And that was the big breakthrough. So that allowed for the development of radio networks and then ultimately TV networks. But it was all being able to use the limited amount of content that was being produced, sell ads against it, and do that in a scale business. And the internet is very much uh, like that. So if you look at the uh, other side of the business, that's the demand side. You look at the supply side. And of course, there is uh, a business where you have a high fixed cost and uh, low marginal cost. There's a very high fixed cost to create those data centers and a relatively low marginal cost to answer an extra query. 
In some sense, the whole web business is in the middle of a transition now because of all these uh, uh, fixed costs that are being turned into variable costs. So you're familiar with uh, Amazon that will sell storage on demand, and Google started a service where they, ser where they sell storage and web hosting. So you're changing what was previously a big upfront investment into an investment that's a variable cost that can be scaled as your business expands. And I think that's going to have a very big impact because it allows for a lot of smaller uh, niche services that weren't economically viable before have now become economically viable. So uh, if you put those together, you've got these uh, situations where the entry costs are fairly high, at least traditionally, because uh, you had to enter at a reasonably uh, large scale. Uh, the user switching costs are very, very low. So as we say at Google, the competition's only a click away. Uh, most people do use multiple search engines in a given month. Maybe you have a preferred search engine, but if you don't find what you want on Google, you might look in one of those other search engines. Um, and of course, the advertisers follow the eyeball. So one of the things that's funny about the uh, business is you can say you're buying ads on Google. Well, typically, then you'll buy ads on other search engines as well, right? It's just like Time and Newsweek. If you're Ford, if you advertise in Newsweek, well, you advertise in time. If you're uh, Amazon, you advertise on Yahoo, Google, MSN, everybody else, because there's no real reason to uh, have a, you know, you're able to reach those extra eyeballs, so why not uh, do it? And so what that means is the market structure that we'd expect to see in that kind of industry is a few large search engines in each country and group, and indeed that's the model that we typically uh, see a highly contestable market for users, so people are competing very intensely to acquire those users. But then you've got a situation where the advertisers are pretty much following uh, the users. And you may have just seen yesterday there's a, been a new chess move in this game where MSN announced that it was going to give rebates on consumer purchases on ads that were shown on MSN. So it's kind of like the credit card business. If you have certain credit cards, they'll give you 1% of your purchases back. So now MSN is saying, we'll give you some fraction of your purchases back. Why are they doing that? Well, obviously, they're hoping to attract the users. They attract the users, the advertisers follow, and then they hope that they can build up that business, uh, in a sort of jumpstart the whole business by offering those cash rebates. So that's a kind of interesting uh, new development. And unlike many online businesses, I would argue that they're relatively small network effects. So uh, there isn't a reason, any reason why you'd expect to see this industry converge to, to a single player or a very small set of players uh, that arise from network effects or even the supply side economies of scale. There's still, in my view at least, plenty of room for uh, new entrants in part because of the phenomenon I mentioned earlier, that people are willing to try new search engines because well, why not? It's just a click away. So my feeling is the industry is going to continue to be a pretty vibrant industry uh, for several years. Now, one way to think about what Google does, this is a matchmaker. It's a two-sided market, or yenta, which is Yiddish for match matchmaker. You're matching up people that are seeking information to people who have information, and you're matching up buyers and sellers. So the performance of the industry is going to depend on the quality of those matches. So the better matches you can make, the better uh, you're going to be doing in terms of your performance. So there's two strands of literature I want to talk about a little bit. One is the information science literature on information retrieval, uh, which is maybe 30 years old or so. And uh, the other is the economics literature on what's called the assignment problem, where the issue is how do you make good assignments of the, of the sort I was just alluding to. So I'm going to talk first about information uh, retrieval. And I should tell you this, my view, the, the little history of information retrieval that I'm going to uh, go through in the next few minutes is a very abbreviated uh, version of a, of, a, of a much longer story, but uh, I think it uh, uh, should get my point across. All right, so what happened? Uh, so pretty much as soon as there were computers, people started putting textual documents on computers, and then they wanted ways to retrieve those textual documents. And so this field began in the 1970s 
where basically you were doing a glorified grep of trying to look through a bunch of documents and find documents that contained uh, certain words or phrases. And uh, like a lot of fields, that proceeded very rapidly at the beginning. You had great progress, and then things slowed down after a while. And uh, by the late 80s, it was pretty much a mature field. So then the national, uh, DARPA uh, and the uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, decided to uh, light a fire under this field because it was very important for lots of applications. And uh, they started something called the TREC, the Text Retrieval Conference. And what they did for that was very interesting. They provided a CD, which then was a pretty new, uh, a pretty new technology. They provided a CD that contained a number of documents and a number of queries. So there are lots of documents. For example, they got a year's worth of articles from the Wall Street Journal. And they got encyclopedia entries and lots of other textual documents. And then they had a bunch of queries and then they commissioned experts, people like reference librarians and CIA analysts and all sorts of uh, people who, who were familiar with the subject matter, and had those people indicate which documents were relevant to which queries. So you got this big set of data. They sent out the CD to the 30 or so research teams that were working in this, uh, in this area, and uh, said, here you are, train your systems on this data. So all of them took the data, they trained their systems, they tried to each try out their algorithm that they preferred for doing this information retrieval. And then they went to the main conference, the Trek conference, and uh, were given new data, this time without the answers, just the queries and the documents, but no indication of relevance. And then everybody tried to uh, uh, use their system on this new fresh set of data and it was a bit of a competition. So they didn't really, uh, some people called it a shootout where they were trying to see whose system performed best and it gave you certain bragging rights if you had the best performer for that year. So an example of one of the algorithms that was used is, uh, is a probabilistic matching where you had prob probability that the document was relevant to the query with some function of the characteristics of the document and query. And a very standard way to do that is to use a logistic regression, where the log odds is a linear function of the uh, characteristics. So a typical set of explanatory variables in this context might be things like the terms in common, the query length, the collection size, the frequency of occurrence of the term in the document, and so on. And each of those would be explanators, explanatory variables for this uh, probability of relevance judgment. So these algorithms then, the TREC conference gave a big boost to information retrieval. There were a lot, because they had a standardized collection of documents, because they had uh, a way that, do, that uh, methods could be compared against each other, and they had these uh, public uh, competition, you saw a significant uh, boost in the field. But then by the middle of the 1990s, the algorithms for information re retrieval were pretty mature, and again, the innovation or the level of development was in the order of a percent or two each, uh, at each Trek conference and wasn't really doing a lot of, uh, of action. Well, then the web comes along. And people began to realize that we needed search engines for the web, immediately turned to these information retrieval engines, and uh, computer scientists got interested. Before, this was mostly people who were just specializing in information retrieval. Some people were in the computer science uh, area. Some people were uh, out of library science, information science, a variety of different areas. And what they realized, I think, uh, uh, particularly the computer science researchers, the link structure of the web became a new explanatory variable. So instead of just looking at the documents and queries on a single basis, you could use the fact that some documents pointed to other documents, and that was, in fact, a useful uh, variable that had not been part of TREC, right? TREC was just a flat document structure. And here you had this particular structure that was imposed by the web. So now in the, uh, the mid-90s then, uh, as everybody knows, uh, Brin and Page uh, came up with this idea of page rank, where you measured how many important sites linked to a given site, and that had a quite significant improvement on the 
uh, relevance, the performance of web search results. So they tried to sell their algorithm to Yahoo for a million dollars, but Yahoo thought that was too expensive because at this time it was widely viewed, and I can attest to this because people would come into my office and tell me that search, that was a totally commoditized business. There were a few standard algorithms that were out there. They all performed about as well as the other, and there wasn't any way it was going to get bigger, and there definitely weren't any commercial opportunities available. And this is the conventional wisdom circa 1995. It's widely believed. We were, and the reason I know this is we were debating the uh, curriculum at the information school at Berkeley, and you know, obviously we're going to have databases, and obviously we'd have some intellectual property and policy and other things, but the question was, should we put in uh, search? And there were arguments on both sides. Lots of people thought it was just something where you went and looked things up in a book and copied out the algorithm, and there you were. All right, well, what's interesting is Larry and Sergey were the two of the few people that didn't believe this. They thought it was possible to improve the quality of search, and they started Google. Uh, they had no real idea of how they were going to make money. At that time, the model that was the most likely would be selling search appliances to uh, businesses for intranet search. Uh, but um, everybody else was pretty much convinced search would be commodified, and uh, nobody could come up with a good business model, much like the story I told you of broadcast radio. Well. What happened then is a kind of nice story that uh, really emanated out of Caltech. A company called GoTo came up with this model of auctioning search results. So they said, instead of using an algorithm to determine which search results are best, we'll just let, pe let people bid on uh, their search results. And you type in a query, the highest bidder gets the first place in the search results. Well, that model didn't really work out very well because people wanted some kind of objective determination of search results. But, over, but GoTo changed this model and its name, became Overture, and they uh, then said, let's auction off ads. So the search results were determined algorithmically, but the ads were determined via an auction. So Google saw this in the, in the fall of 2001 saw what Overture had done and thought that was a pretty good idea because Google would run up against this problem of how do you actually sell in price ads? Because at that time there was a program called uh, AdWords, um, AdWords Premium, which put ads at the top of the page of search results, and those ads were tied to keywords, but they were priced by a sales force. So if you were selling dog food, and you wanted to show your ad next to anybody who was searching on dog food, then you would negotiate with the salesperson on what the price would be. And the price was expressed in dollars per thousand impressions. So $10 CPM uh, might be a typical number, but where did the $10 come from? Right? You talk to different salesmen, you might get a different number. And people started realizing that there were millions of different things that people were searching on, so there are millions of different keywords, and how do you come up with prices for all those millions of different words? Well, the auction was uh, a good model because then essentially people were setting the prices themselves. So in the original overture model, people bid for keywords uh, to be shown, and overture also had the idea of paying per click, so you didn't just have to pay per impression, the way the rest of the advertising business worked, but you actually paid per click. The ads were assigned to slots depending on the bids. The highest bidders got the best slots, which tended to be the higher up slots, and also the highest bidder paid what he bid. So it's what an economist calls a first price auction. You enter your bid, somebody clicks in your ad, you pay what you bid, ads are ranked by bids, and that was the structure of the uh, go-to or overture auction. So Google thought they could improve on that, and they improved on it in a couple different ways. Oh, well, here's an example. I should show you what I'm talking about. So the ads are based on query plus keywords. So the distinction in the industry is the query is what the user enters, the keyword is what the advertiser buys, and there's a question of whether the query matches the keyword or the keyword matches the query. And there can be exact match, where it has to be a 
precise match. There could be a broad match. There's phrase match. There's negative match. There's all sorts of different definitions of match. But uh, basically, that's a fairly straightforward uh, uh, issue. And here are these top two ads. So that's what's called promoted ads, the ones that are the, get, get the most attention. And then there's the ads on the right-hand side uh, over uh, there on, on that side of the page. OK, so that's a little picture of what the ads look like. Now, in the Google auction, the two improvements that they made were, in fact, instead of ranking the ads just by the bid, they ranked the ads times the price per click times the clicks per impression. So it's going to be the bid times the click-through rate. And if you think about it, what that's giving you is the price per impression, right? Price per click times clicks per impression is price per impression. And the reason that's noteworthy is that's what Google has to sell, an impression, an ad impression. So what you're doing is you want to sell the impression not just to the highest bidder, but to the advertiser that's going to generate the highest expected revenue. So think, for example, suppose you were selling 747s and you want to buy the keyword airplane. Well, there aren't that many people who want to buy 747s. I mean, Larry and Sergey, they've already got a plane anyway, so they're out of the market. There aren't that many people that want a 747, so you, even though Boeing would be able, willing to pay a very, very high price for an interested customer, you don't get many clicks. But you might have a model airplane maker who's selling little model airplanes. Lots of people might be interested in buying those, so you could have a higher expected revenue from showing a much, much cheaper ad if it had many more clicks. So the point is, it's much better advertise on, uh, I mean, it's much, much better to use a ranking based on expected revenue than on expected clicks. And then the second innovation was used a second price auction. So each bidder paid a price that was determined by the bidder beneath him, and the price was the minimum price necessary to retain the position. So you bid a certain amount. Here's the guy below you. The price you had to pay was not what you bid, but it would be the price that would just be sufficient to keep you ahead of the nearest competition. And why is that? Well, there is an economic argument, which I'll mention in a minute, but it was really motivated by a computer engineering argument, namely, uh, if you, uh, if you didn't have a first price auction, then each bidder would want to lower his price himself until he's just paying enough to meet the competition. Why pay more than you have to? You'd rather experiment with lowering the price. What that meant is you have to be logging on to your account minute, minute by minute basis and keep adjusting your price to find the price that would just keep you in the position that you wanted to be in. So I put a very heavy load in the system. It was much better from Google's viewpoint to just do that adjustment for you. So it was what we called the AdWords discounter, automatically discounted the bid so as to be the uh, minimum necessary to retain the position. And eventually Overture adopted both the uh, second price model, which I just described, and also this last sentence says they're currently moving to improve ranking method. Actually, uh, they moved to the ranking method uh, last summer. So now Google and Overture, Google and Yahoo, are both basically using the, uh, the same uh, system, as is Microsoft. So uh, one of the interesting things you could do is, if you're going to do it all over again, there's another approach that's interesting, and that's what's called the Vickery Clark Groves, or VCG pricing. Uh, I kind of joke that it's usually called VCG, except in San Diego, where we call it GCV, because Ted Groves is a faculty member here in the uh, economics department and came up with this uh, algorithm in his thesis uh, several years ago. Uh, the idea there is instead of placing your bid depending on what others are bidding, you could charge each advertiser the cost that he imposes on the other advertisers. Okay? So the way you think about that is imagine all these advertisers ranked and say, what would happen if we took out the guy that was in position number three? Well, then the person that was in four would move up to three. Person that was in five would move up to four, person with six to move up to five. And because they were each then in more prominent positions, they'd each get a few more clicks. And you could contemplate charging each advertiser the cost that he imposed on all the advertisers below him. And it turns out that with some analysis, you can show that under that system 
the optimal bid is to report your true value per click, how much the, how much the click is actually uh, worth to you. Under the current system, it turns out you don't want to report the true value per click. You'd like to bias your report down to some degree, but uh, you still end up with essentially the same revenue as you would get through this uh, VCG uh, method. So uh, there's a, been a lot of interesting work in field of algorithmic mechanism design that looks at different mechanisms that you could use to do this kind of, uh, of uh, operation. Uh, this particular one has a lot of advantages and we've done some experiments and thought about it and maybe someday we might uh, switch to using something a little different. Now, it's fairly straightforward to figure out what the outcome of the Google auction should be. When I uh, first went to Google, Eric uh, Schmidt uh, asked me to take a look at the auction and see if I could apply some of the tools of game theory to formulate a model of what behavior looked like in that auction. And it's fairly straightforward to figure out, uh, figure out what that is. And the basic principle that you want to utilize is the principle that in equilibrium, each bidder must prefer the position he's in to any other position. So think about a bidder, he's in position number three, he could bid a little bit more, he'd move into position number two, he'd pay more money, but he'd get more clicks. And so the question you have to ask yourself is, is are the extra clicks that I get worth the extra money I have to pay? Or if you're in position three, you could bid a little less, you'd move down a slot. If you move down a slot, then you'd save some money, but you get fewer clicks. So again, you have to ask yourself the question, of what are those, uh, you know, do I, is the value that I save compensate me for losing the uh, clicks? So just writing down those inequalities and manipulating them gives you a pretty good impression, uh, picture of what the Nash equilibrium looks like. It gives you a set of inequalities that you can use to describe equilibrium, but then maybe the more interesting thing is you convert those inequalities. So instead of saying, here's some values per click, what do the prices have to be to make this an equilibrium? You could look at it the other direction, say, here's the prices. What values were implied by those prices? So just as I mentioned a minute ago, when you look at this calculation in terms of, are those extra clicks worth the extra amount I have to pay? You could flip that around and see, well, how much extra does he have to pay? That must be an upper bound on how much those extra clicks are worth, okay? So it's a kind of a nice little trick. Given values, you can compute prices, or given prices, you can compute what values would be under the assumption that the advertisers are behaving in a rational way. They're making a rational choice. So let's see here. The basic result that you get if you do this analysis is that the incremental cost per click, which is going to be the extra cost for the extra clicks, that has to be increasing in the click-through rate. As you move up the page, so you have more higher and higher click-through rate, then the incremental cost per click has to increase. And the reason, from an economic point of view, is very simple, just what I wrote there. If the incremental cost per click ever went down, then what that means is that somebody bought expensive clicks, but they passed up cheap clicks. So if the cost of the, so I bought clicks that were worth 50 cents to me, and now the incremental cost of buying extra clicks is 30 cents. Well, if, I, if, the, if the previous clicks were worth 50 cents, I should buy those clicks that are worth 30 cents. If I don't do that, I'm behaving uh, irrationally, at least according to, to this model. So it's similar to what you see in standard intermediate microeconomics. You end up with price equal to marginal cost, which in this context says the value of the clicks has to equal the incremental cost per click and uh, the marginal cost has to be increasing, uh, which is to say here the incremental cost has to be increasing in the click-through rate. So I've got a paper up on my website at Berkeley if you want to go through the mathematics of this. It's just an exercise of manipulating inequalities, but it's one of these things where you get a, a perhaps a slightly uh, interesting uh, result that comes out of it. Now, let me give you a simple example here just to get a feel for how you can use this economic analysis in this context. 
So let's look at a special case. Suppose that all the advertisers have a value per click V. So everybody's the same. There's two cases. One is undersold auctions, when there's more slots on the page than there are bidders. And the other case is oversold auctions. So those are the cases where there are more bidders than slots. So what do you do if you have an undersold auction? Well, it turns out the last ad on the page has to pay a reserve price, a minimum price, and uh, it's a little bit complicated these days, but uh, roughly speaking, let's say it's around five cents. So the minimum price per click uh, in the uh, undersold auction would be five cents. And uh, if you have an oversold auction, well then the last bidder pays the price determined by the first excluded bidder, okay? So that'll be whatever the value of the click is to that uh, excluded bidder. So let's look at the undersold pages. If they all have the same value, if everybody has the same value per click, then it must be that the profit per click that you're getting from being in slot S is equal to the profit per click that you could get if you were in the last slot in the page. Everybody's got the same price, the same value per click. They've got to be indifferent between all the different positions they could be in. And uh, that gives you the equality in the middle of the page. And that says that the expenditure on slot S PS times XS, the price per click times the number of clicks that you get in slot S, has to be equal to the expenditure you'd make on the bottom slot plus the value of those extra clicks. So before I was talking about these incremental costs per click, well, you have to look at the value of the extra clicks that you get, which is expressed right there. So payment for slot S is payment for the last position plus the value of the incremental clicks. Very simple. So um, example, you have uh, 100 clicks in position one, 80 clicks in position two, value per click is 50 cents, the reserve price per click is five cents. You solve that equation they had on the previous page and you get a price per click for position one of 14 cents and a price per click of position two, the reserve price, the minimum price that's uh, specified in the model of five cents. And then you get a certain amount of revenue or if I did my algebra right, it's $18, okay? So that's a little example of what the undersold case looks like. Now what about the oversold case? So there what happens is everybody has to be indifferent between having his slot and not being shown at all. So value minus the cost per click times the number of clicks has to equal zero or the price has to equal the value. So as soon as you make people compete for those slots, then the price gets bid up to the value right away in this very simple example. So in the previous two slot example with three bidders, price is going to be 50 cents, revenue would be $90. Whoa, before it was just $18. Now all of a sudden it's $90. And if you think about it, the logic is if I don't have to compete, if I'm getting a slot no matter what, that's the undersold case, then all that you're paying for is the position premium. All you're paying for is being in this little higher position. But as soon as you have to compete, so it means you either bid this much to get shown or you don't get shown at all, then the amount you're willing to pay is going to be far, far higher. And indeed, if you look at the data, which I guess I don't have here to, to show you, big chunk of the revenue at Google comes from the fully sold pages, the ones that are the most competitive, because that's where the advertisers are really forced to compete and the prices then end up actually reflecting the true value. So that's a very useful insight and we use this measure of fraction of the pages that are fully sold or oversold as a way of indicating how competitive uh, conditions are in a particular country or particular uh, vertical. So now let's think about the uh, issue of the number of ads shown. So you can show more ads, and that pushes revenue up. But on the other hand, the relevancy goes down. So I'm thinking of a situation where there's a certain number of slots in the page, and the question is, how many ads do you want to show? Uh, you can show more ads, the relevancy goes down. And then our view is that if you show people less relevant ads, they're less likely to click. And in the future, they're less likely to look at ads. So you want to have relevancy as a goal 
You don't just care about revenue today, but you care about revenue tomorrow. So you can formulate a model where the probability of a click depends on the, on the uh, degree of relevancy, and if the ad is deemed to be relevant by the user, they'll click more in the future. So you can look at a little stochastic dynamic programming model where you uh, balance out the short run profit from showing the ad with the long run profit that you would get by encouraging people to click on more ads in the future. And indeed, we actually have a model of that sort which we use to drive this decision of where the relevancy cutoff should be for the ads. So I don't know if you've followed the news reports for the last few years, but Google's been emphasizing ad quality, ad quality, ad quality. So our view is we want to have fewer ads that are higher quality, they're more likely to get clicks, they're more likely to get conversions in the sense that the advertiser would then actually make a sale. And then, of course, if people are rewarded for clicking in the sense of getting something that they really find to be relevant, then they're much more likely to click in the future. And so a lot of the uh, action in our uh, group there at Google has been in trying to improve this ad quality. Um, one interesting thing about how this works is uh, the fact that in a web 2.0 business like Google, where the product is really delivered in real time over the web, it's possible to engage in continuous improvement. Way back in the 80s, they had this uh, Japanese method of manufacture called Kaizen, continuous improvement in production processes. So this was pioneered by the Japanese auto companies. They wanted to continuously improve production quality, tuning the assembly line, uh, adjusting the worker behavior, changing the lighting, making small incremental improvements to make the product better and better and better, more and more reliable. Well, at Google, we're doing the same sort of thing on the software side uh, because we can continually monitor user behavior. We can continually monitor advertiser behavior we can run experiments in real time to see how changes in the parameters affect users' behavior and see what generates better quality searches and better revenue. So at any one time, Google is actually running hundreds of experiments. Now, some of you may have noticed this, that one day you do a search result, the next day you do the same search, it's something different. Sometimes the user interface is a little different. Sometimes you will we'll be adjusting the lines on a, uh, you know, a separator bar by a few pixels, changing the color. Last year, we switched the color of the top ads from being blue to being yellow and saw a very substantial increase in the click-through rate and the revenue generated. So simple things like changing fonts, changing colors, changing page layouts, they can have a big impact on user behavior. And then more substantive changes, like changing the ad ranking algorithm, changing the search algorithm. You can interleave the results, so one user sees this set of results, another user sees a different set of results. Look at the click-through rates, find the ones that give you the best response, and thereby continually improve your product. So we build an experimental infrastructure that allows us to run these hundreds of experiments at a time, and so the product is getting better on a day-by-day -day and week-by-week basis. So you've got very rapid and subtle improvement, and this learning by doing leads to significant uh, competitive advantage. So building that experimental infrastructure is not so easy because it makes it a more complicated problem for web serving in some sense. On the other hand, it has a gigantic payoff because then you can continually improve your product. So uh, my view is that marketing really is the new finance uh, back in the 70s, we saw finance take a, a quantum leap because they had widely available data sets, computerized technology, analytic methods allows them to improve uh, on marketing quite uh, on finance quite dramatically. Well, nowadays we can do the same thing with marketing because just as Google has the capability of uh, handling these kinds of real-time improvements on our system, we can offer that capability to advertisers and publishers to do real-time experimenting with their marketing method uh, mechanism. So as an example, one of the things you can do with uh, these little search ads is you can offer Google three different creatives. So instead of saying, here's my search ad, period, you can say, well, here are three shots, pick the one that's best. So Google will rotate those 
three different creatives and find the one that's performing best in terms of the click-through rate, and that's definitely in the interest of the advertiser. And the same thing on the publisher side. So suppose a user comes to the advertiser's site. The advertiser has a lot of questions about how that should be laid out, you know, what font should it use, what colors, what uh, link structure, etc. You can rotate different uh, ad, uh, di different page configurations and see which one is performing the best and do this again in real time. So that's part of Google Analytics allows you to do this web page optimization that allows a publisher to decide that this particular layout or this particular structure is giving much better performance than another structure. So again, it's a case where the products can evolve in real time and continuously improve. So uh, what we believe is that the quantitative methods for analyzing this kind of commercial data are extremely valuable. Having a good system for storing and manipulating that data is critical. Having a system to do experimentation is paramount. And really, we're just at the beginning in terms of exploiting these kinds of systems for improved economic performance. So that's pretty much the message I'd like to uh, leave you with. And I'm happy to take questions. So thank you. <laughs> questions? Yes? To the visibility? Yeah. Like, uh, I don't think it is very easy to uh, measure the ROI on the ads that you give on Google. But uh, companies do say that, OK, we are visible, so we are gaining something. OK. Okay, so the question is, how do you measure the value of the, of the visibility? And the way we refer to that internally is we say, what about the impression value? What's the value of the impression itself as opposed to just uh, the click? Well, the kind of interesting thing there is, uh, in a way, the auction that we're running is an auction for impressions. Because remember, we're ranking based on uh, price per click times clicks per impression. And uh, in some sense, what the advertiser is bidding on in that price per, is, is that price per impression. So in general, it's not something that we're really in a position to tell the advertiser what they should be doing. The advertiser has to make this judgment about how much those impressions are really worth. We can help you in measuring the value of the click and the value of the conversion, but this judgment of how much the uh, impression value is worth is something the advertisers really have to decide pretty much on their own. Um, there's also another component to this, another little subtlety, is, of course, if you're in a business where you make repeat sales, all right, in that case, having a new user of your website uh, isn't, you know, doesn't just revolve around how much that person purchases today, but also there's some value in the fact that they'll come back next week or next month or sometime in the future and purchase more things. So if you look at this, particularly for people who are selling online vitamins or uh, something where there's going to be repeat purchases, uh, then it's typically the case that the relevant variable is the value per uh, lifetime value of a user, where you're trying to look at the uh, value you, you, the person will contribute over the course of uh, their relationship. So uh, there's also some subtleties in estimating that. Other questions? Yes? Yep. Saying, look up books about, you know, whatever I typed right. in, and then you'd click it, and there really would be nothing there. Yeah. Like, and so I'm wondering if that's something that it seems like it isn't happening as much. I don't know if Amazon decided, okay, that was useless, or if you guys, Google, pushed them to say, okay, you're degrading the quality of having our sponsored links because people are getting frustrated when there's nothing really there that's right. relevant. Well, that's, ex that's exactly the kind of example that I'm uh, referring to. 
Uh, eBay had the same issue where whatever you typed in, then say buy X on eBay. And that actually turned out to be a bit of a problem because you'd see things like, you know, buy dead babies on eBay. And so this was a little, but then it turns out there is some punk rock band called Dead Babies. So it makes, the, the problem is we didn't have all those stupid band titles, so it would be a lot easier because uh, the, uh, the thing is, it's exactly that where you're trying to look not just at whether people click, so that's this question of the click-through rate, but then you might want to look at indicators of landing page quality. So if you click through to an ad and you click right back within a second, that's probably a pretty bad ad because it's got a bad landing page and induced the person to click, but the experience that they had was not something that uh, was really very useful. So that measure of sort of short clicks or click duration turns out to be a good measure for uh, ad quality as well. And actually, we have an index of ad quality that uses 20 or so different indicators to try to measure uh, performance. Yes? How did that performance measure change when tab browsing was invented? When what? Oh, tab browsing. Yeah, that's an that's a interesting uh, issue, too. Um, the, what we do is we have uh, human evaluators who we show ads to, typical users, you know, typical user study. They look at ads, we record all sorts of characteristics of the ads, and then we use machine learning statistical techniques to find the indicators that seem to be most in accord with the human user evaluation. So as the technology changes, these uh, functions automatically get adjusted. So if, uh, as, as tab browsing, for example, becomes more and more prevalent, then this comes up in the, uh, in, as a potential signal for the human evaluation studies. Other questions? Yes? you in terms of, of setting the prices. Absolutely. Um, but an interesting thing is, of course, the advertisers are competing against themselves. Uh, and so, you know, I think we're all sort of aware of the notion of click fraud. Um, but I'm very curious if you believe that that's a mechanism, if that is a phenomena that can be countered through economic means as well. In other words, I know of a lot of uh, mechanisms to combat click fraud that have to do with, you know, who's doing the clicking, are these bots and so forth. Uh, but do you believe that that's something that the market itself can be made robust to, or is that an externality that we need other mechanisms to deal with? So we have a whole team of people that works on click fraud and other kinds of fraud, and uh, all of our, uh, obviously I can't talk about the details of how that works, but they're all, all, all the obvious things we catch, and many of the much less obvious things. Uh, the uh, Interesting. I mean, there are many amusing stories about this, but unfortunately, I can't. Uh, I can't reveal. There are some things that are purely um, economic in nature. For one thing, we have this system called smart pricing. So, if you look at publishers, there are high-quality publishers, which in this context means the advertise the advertisements get a lot of attention and clicks. And then there are low-quality publishers where people don't tend to stay on those publishers very long and the ads don't get many clicks, etc. There's something we call MFA pages, which are made-for-ads pages. And you probably encountered these when you do a query. You'll do a query on headaches. You'll be taken to a page where it's about headaches, but maybe there's a copy of the Wikipedia article about headaches, and then there's a whole bunch of... of uh, ads uh, associated with organic headache remedies or whatever, those are not very good pages from Google's uh, point of view. And if they don't convert well, if advertisers who go to those pages, uh, if people go to the pages and click on the ads but don't end up buying, then those uh, publishers get penalized in, in various ways. So we have a lot of performance measures. We're trying to look at not just do people click but do they find the ads useful and do they buy uh, is, is, of course, the strongest ultimate indicator. So there's a lot of stuff like this. We're trying to get performance measures which actually relate to what users' interests are because that's the most important constituent in our, in our, uh, uh, of the groups that we serve. Yes? 
Yeah, so how do we know if somebody buys? Well, we have this service called conversion tracking. And what happens is if you want to, if you're an advertiser, you can ask Google to track your conversions, track your purchases, and then tie those back to the clicks and creatives and all those other things so you can improve the quality of your ads by looking at whether they resulted in actual purchases. So it's just a program for advertisers, uh, but of course we can also use that aggregate data as a, uh, as a performance measure. Yeah, so the question was, how do we know that a particular purchase came from a Google-sponsored ad versus uh, somebody who just went directly? And the answer is, when the ad is clicked, then there's a cookie set, and then uh, later on, when a purchase is made on this conversion tracking system, it said, oh, there was a Google ad that was clicked on within the last, whatever, 24 hours. So the system is set up to link the clicks to the, to the ads. Yes, way in the back. So YouTube is a great example. One of the projects this year is to try to figure out ways to monetize YouTube more effectively. And we've experimented with, uh, I think, 20, over 20 different ad formats on YouTube, doing exactly the kind of uh, thing I described a few minutes ago, where these are typically very carefully designed experiments with treatment and control. So you're randomizing which user gets to see which kind of uh, ad and trying to figure out which ads perform, perform best. Um, there's a couple problems there. One problem is um, you know, advertisers like to review what their ad is being shown next to uh, because they have their own brand perception and brand image of the product. So that introduces this human delay into the system. There's a situation of the user doesn't want the viewing experience to be interrupted. After all, a lot of these videos on YouTube are just a few minutes long, so you don't want to run through a bunch of commercials to watch the videos. So the trick is to find the right balance between an ad which is relevant and yet not obtrusive. And so that's the the trade-off we're trying to make of exactly where we want to be in that context. I think there are actually lots of uh, commercial opportunities on, on YouTube, um, and it's just going to be a challenge of finding out which ones are most, uh, most effective. But we're doing it in a pretty systematic manner of trying to do exactly that. Any other questions? Yes, here's one. So that's an extremely interesting question, and uh, the cheap answer is it was a user interface decision. So in fact, Google has eight right-hand side ad slots and up to three top ad slots, and that was determined, determined uh, way back at the beginning because we wanted to have 10 ads, and if you had 10, ad, sorry, 10 search results, and then it turns out that eight ads fit in about that, uh, that same position. So the question is, would you want to change that uh, maximum number of ads per page? And it's possible you would. Uh, I have more, much more elaborate models of what might go into that decision. But the tricky part is, of course, it's not just the revenue side of things that matters, but it's the user's attention or cognitive overload. You may not want to search through a list of 15 ads. Maybe you'd be much happier, happier searching through a list of six ads. So right now, I would say we're not tinkering with that dimension uh, because we don't really feel that we have enough information to uh, find out the, the best answer. And the default that we have of eight ads seems to be pretty, work pretty well in practice. Yes? Things like uh, the Google checkout, uh, with respect to uh, distinguishing that from other more well-known uh, uh, websites like Amazon or? 
Yeah, so the Google checkout, we view that as primarily a service to the merchant. So the idea there is that the merchant and the user, so it's a situation where if you fill out your information in Google checkout, then you basically got one-click shopping for the internet because you can go to any other checkout merchant, it'll fill in all of your address information and your credit card information and everything else so you can make that purchase a lot easier. So Google Checkout is primarily a way of providing uh, fraud control, a payment system for the merchant, convenience for the user, and it just is like making these transactions less costly or providing lubrication for the transactions so people find it easier to buy things on the internet. So it's not meant to be a profit center for Google, it's really meant to be a way to facilitate internet commerce and make life a lot easier for both merchants and users. So I think I'll take one more question and then we'll end. Over here. Ninety-eight <laughs> percent, so huge, huge amount. It's all basically all coming from ads. There's some other businesses. You know, we're providing uh, Google Apps, so we're providing email service uh, for universities. So, University of Arizona outsourced all of its email service to Google. Uh, we have some other models like that, but right now it's really very much an ad-driven business. And it's not just the online ads. Today I've talked about search ads. There's also, of course, the contextual ads. That's AdSense. And then there are also radio, TV, and print ads. We're providing advertising services for those media. So again, it's really the model of the Yenta, the two-sided market, where you're matching up people with things to buy, uh, people who want to, uh, sorry, sorry, people who want to buy things to people who want to sell them. And what we've been focusing on is trying to find matches that are the most effective uh, in terms of uh, making those arrangements. So that's the model that we've been pursuing, and we're going to continue to pursue that for the foreseeable future. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.